Welcome to the Rogue Startups Podcast, where two startup founders are sharing lessons learned and pitfalls to avoid in their online businesses. And now, here's Dave and Craig. All right, welcome back to another episode of Rogue Startups. Uh, today, I have my good friend Steve McLeod on the show. Steve, how's it going? I'm going well, thanks, Craig. Awesome. So, Steve, many folks that listen to this podcast may also know you from the Bootstrap podcast. Do you want to kind of give a, a plug and a bit of a, a, an intro of, of what that's all about for folks who aren't listening currently? Sure. The Bootstrap podcast is something I actually inherited. Uh, it was started a few years ago by Ian Lansman and Andre Butoff. After a few years, they wanted to concentrate on their core project, so they gave me the chance to start a new iteration of it, which I've been doing for about a year. Episodes are weekly almost weekly, <laughs> and uh, we cover themes that are important for people trying to bootstrap a software product or who are currently bootstrapping a software product, whether it be B2B, SaaS, or desktop products, or even like info, in, info products. Cool, cool. Yeah, I would say that you know folks that listen to this show would find a lot of kind of similarities and overlap with the things that y'all talk about there. Uh, and I know you have uh, frequent co-hosts and Ed Freifogel, former guest on this podcast and kind of friend of ours uh, has been on there a bunch. So I think it's cool for you guys to to kind of have that running thread of, of kind of things that y'all talk about and kind of follow your journey there. So yeah, it's a really, it's a really good show. Thank you. I really yeah. enjoy doing it. So, so I think, you know, Steve, we have been talking, well, for a long time, we've known each other for a few years now. And, and, and I think one interesting thing that we want to talk about today that I would suppose you get a lot of questions about, I certainly do, is... What is it like to live in another country? What is it like to be a full-time kind of permanent expat, right? And I think we're going to be really honest. I hope we're, we're really <laughs> honest uh, here. And it's not all great and it's not all terrible, but I think uh, hopefully we can kind of shed some light on stuff that folks don't talk about. You haven't seen in blog posts about kind of what it's really like to live in another country. But maybe I, if Steve kind of begin with kind of like, Maybe share with folks where you're from and where you're currently living and what that whole kind of situation looks like. Sure. So I'm from New Zealand, but partly grew up in Australia too. So that means to New Zealanders, I sound Australian, and to Australians, I sound New Zealandish, like a New Zealander. Uh, I'm currently living in Barcelona, Spain, and I've been here for eight years. The reasons I came here are long and varied, but I am here and it's a wonderful place to live most of the time. It's an interesting place to run a business. And when I say interesting, I mean difficult. But uh, <laughs> you don't move to Spain before ease of running business. Yeah. Uh, the, the life I'm living here is very much not the digital nomad type that I think a lot of people think these days when you talk about living abroad. You know, they're living in, in a very much a bubble in, uh, in Thailand or Bali. I'm yeah. very much living the life of a, a regular person in Spain. Yeah. And I think that's really important to, to differentiate because, yeah, I mean, there is that like digital nomad uh, you know, Tropical MBA Dynamite Circle kind of group that is fantastic. And we did that for a few months. I think right after I quit my job, we traveled Europe for two and a half months and it's exhausting. <laughs> I would yeah. never, ever, ever do it again. I mean, we have we have kids. I know you have a young daughter too. And, and yeah, we very much try to live like locals. Like we live in a small village just outside of Annecy and we have a lot of local friends and, and try to live like, you know, local, local French folks do. Um, but I definitely can appreciate the difficulty of running a business, I think, in Europe, right? I mean, France, yeah. Spain, yeah. the Netherlands, yeah. even the UK, probably to a, maybe a little bit lesser extent, is just hard. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of things that come to mind when you say running a business in Europe, and maybe you can add uh, another <laughs> handful <laughs> another handful to this. But um, the first is bookkeeping. And I don't mean accounting like taxes you have to pay. I mean bookkeeping. Um, it is... I just talked to Dave for for Rogue Startups yesterday, and he was going to get a bookkeeper. And I was like, "Wow, just use Bench Bench Co. It's like a hundred per almost a hundred percent entirely automated. They hook into Stripe, they hook into my bank account, they hook into PayPal. All of this stuff happens automatically. They send me one email a month and say, "Hey, can you help us categorize these two or three expenses?" I go in, they have like this automated like checklist thing. I say, "This is this, and this is this, and this and this." None of that exists in France. The concept of a bookkeeper doesn't exist. If you ask somebody for like a PL or a balance sheet, they say, that's your job. And so I just <laughs> like, it just blows my mind that like that concept doesn't exist. I mean, this is a 
this is a first world country. Like this is, mm-hmm. this is not some undeveloped. And, and so anyway, that for me, as far as running a, a business, that is the hardest thing. Um, and all of the tax and insurance stuff and, and just complexity of paperwork that goes along with that is kind of in the similar vein. So I, I don't know. I'm sure that that rings true to you because you're nodding a lot. But is there is there anything else that like when you say running a business in Spain is not easy? Does like, it what look comes like to I'm mind? nodding? Does it look like I'm <laughs> nodding? I'm crying. I'm trying to hold back the tears. <laughs> what, what was this, this app you mentioned where for American companies it just does everything? I can't yeah. believe it. Ah, oh, I would kill for that. We can't use the famous international bookkeeping software like Zero and so on because it just doesn't work in Spain with the Spanish laws for exactly what you describe. Everything here is hard. Yeah, I don't know I don't know how that came to be, but all the bookkeeping stuff is difficult. The really strange laws, which I still haven't got my head around after eight years, and we do have a professional. We use uh, a guest door, as they call them here in Spain, she runs a little company and helps businesses like mine. And without her, we would be drowning. And she's always asking me to sign some form or, you know, do something on the ba- some type of bank transfer to the to the taxation department again. And I actually don't understand much of it. And mm. I have to say, I don't have a clear idea of just how profitable my business is. And it's it kind Scary, of disturbs right? me. Yeah. All I know is that most years there's more money in the bank account than there was at the beginning. Yeah, that's yeah. really painful. And I don't know how much of that is because it is objectively difficult here or is it because I just don't have the right mentality not having grown up in Spain and I don't understand these things. I expect them to be the way they were in my home country, which, of course, they're not. So maybe I'm mm. the problem. Maybe Spain's actually got a really good system. No, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, like, Steve, how would you categorize your Spanish level? Because I think that's a big part of a lot of this. Um, how, how family friendly is this podcast? <laughs> extremely, <laughs> or extremely not. So you, for you feel free to be honest. Uh, my my Spanish has a lot of room to improve. I can read things and newspaper articles and so on, but I can't engage in casual conversations beyond you know talking about the weather or or the sports. Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I, I would say my French is similar. I can talk to you know our kids friends parents and talk to people at the store and but our accountant speaks english which is great um wow. i would totally be lost otherwise yeah and 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 yeah trying to do business and in, in french and for you spanish would probably be would probably be really difficult and, and i think that like one of the one of the and i think we're going to talk mostly about bad things in this podcast <laughs> because i think every like you mentioned before we started recording like everybody sees like on Instagram, the pictures at the beach in October and it's beautiful or the pictures of going skiing in the Alps, which are 30 minutes away. And all like all of that stuff is really obvious, I think. But but maybe, you know, I think like Dave and I talk, we have a responsibility to be honest about the downside of a lot mm-hmm. of things. And I mm-hmm. think that's a lot of why you and I wanted to have this conversation. How do you make How friends? Does... How do you make friends? Like if, you're, mm. if your French is not very good and I guess your neighbors generally don't have a great level of English or are not comfortable speaking it. Yep. This is what you don't think about before you move to a, to another country where the language is not what you learn. How, how do you make friends in this situation? And it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So m- almost all of our friends are parents of our kids' friends. So we live in a small town. Each of our kids, like school classes is like 20 kids. And so they each have a handful of little friends and our friends are, are their parents. Are they French? And so, oh yeah, yep. Great. And mo- most of them speak some some level of English because we live in a pretty international area with Geneva being like 20 minutes away. So a lot of people go to Geneva and work at, to some extent in English. Uh-huh. But we speak French with them all the time. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's something you don't think about. Uh, well, I certainly didn't think about is that how hard it would be to actually get into local circles until you have a really good level of the language. But the best way to get a good level of the language is to actually immerse yourself in the culture and make local friends. My yep. my saving grace was um, people who live locally are from local but have lived abroad and now they've come back home. They kind of mm. want to maintain international life to some degree, even if it's like through other people and they want to practice their English and so on. That was my way of making local friends. Yeah, yeah. And uh, your partner is Spanish? She's Italian. 
Uh, she's Italian. She, okay. she speaks all the languages fluently, which is really frustrating to watch somebody who can do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> we went for a trip to Brazil a few years ago. And in the one month we were there, she went from speaking beginner level of Portuguese to being able to have conversations with taxi drivers on political things. And I, yeah, that was so it's frustrating amazing, to isn't watch. It's it it amazing. Yeah. It's also very useful to have in a, in a partner. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I think that just comes from you. I think you almost only see that people who grow up in Europe and, uh, you know, grow up Italian or Spanish and learn French and Spanish and Portuguese and all this kind of stuff, because like in the U S or, or even here, our kids are obviously fluent in English, but like in school, they're only learning like today is Tuesday. It is sunny. And my daughter is 10. You know, uh -huh. and so like her kids in her class can't count to 10 in English. And and like that is such a shame compared to other like northern European countries uh, like the Netherlands and Sweden and stuff that I mean, they're full time English learning from a very young age. Um, I think the difference there is probably that like Spanish or French or Italian or those countries are so big that you can get by or up until now, you could have gotten by without learning English and, and working in another language um, because you can just kind of live in your bubble. Um, but, but you know, the Netherlands is such a small place that you can't just know Dutch and think you can get by. Um, so they have to learn a language. But I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think the language thing, like to get to the point maybe where we're at, where it's like, I can go to a restaurant and order a coffee. I can get in a taxi and tell them where I want to go is great. But then that, like, that next level is a huge jump in learning and you know fluency to yeah I, I i do think that that is i don't know maybe the thing that's holding us back right of feeling super comfortable where we are okay so do you do you feel like you are part of the community or you feel you're an outsider both i guess you know okay. like yeah and, and this really chaps my ass like i think our friends have pity on us <laughs> you know <laughs> like you know you, yeah. I mean, you just think about it like you you so you go to a you know a party or a coffee shop or something and there's someone there that doesn't speak great english you would take the extra time to to talk to them and want to help them and stuff but if it's every day uh -huh. eventually they're going to be like like come on just learn right or yeah. don't and go away and like you could learn, but it's it's a, a big commitment of time, and you've got a business to run and a family yep. to 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 uh, tend to, and I hope like maybe some health interests and whatever. And it's it's actually quite hard to find the time and to prioritize that. I I am in that kind of battle myself, and I want to spend more time learning Spanish, but not at the cost of my business. Mm, mm. My business gets and my best my best energy at the moment. Yeah, your business is, right? So I guess we should take a step back and talk about kind of what, what you do. Uh, and you have two businesses now, right? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty foolish, huh? <laughs> One's tough, <laughs> two's tougher. Yeah, I have a um, – why can't I think of what my products are? Feature Up Food. I've been running that for three and a half years. This is a, a forum in which your customers can suggest and upvote improvements to your product. Uh, the other one is Sabre Feedback, which I actually acquired a few months ago. So I haven't built it from scratch. And this one is a feedback button you can add to any website. So it's a kind of synergy between the two products, although they don't integrate yet. Uh, feature upvotes growing quite well uh, every month. We have more customers than the month before, and it's been like that since we started. Sabre Feedback, the one I acquired, is, is in a plateau. And it was before I took it over. And my battle at the moment is growing that and getting it out of the slump. Mm -hmm. And what does your team look like? Uh, I assume you have like a shared team that works across both apps. Is that right? Exactly. We're, I was surprised today to see that we're six people. I thought we were five. And then Slack told me that we have six users and I counted and that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was trying to count in Spanish and not in, not in English. Uh, and that they're all part time. So we have a... a you know what? We are five. I just realized we are because one person had to stop working for because of family uh, uh, situation for a few months. Um, yes, we are five currently. We have a content person. We have a web uh, developer, system admin, uh, a general person who does a lot of everything. That's my girlfriend and me. And, oh, yeah, we just got a designer to start uh, last month mm. to start whipping our products into shape. 
making them look better and more usable. Yeah, everybody that's cool. works part time, so we're much much smaller than we sound from that. For for your designer, I'd love to. We we have a designer that we work with part time on kind of project basis, but I'd love to hear how you work with your designer because I think for us it's made a huge difference. I'd love to hear how you guys work together on on the apps. Yeah, it's still quite new, and I think we're still working out exactly how to do that. It's just a month now since he started working, and uh, uh, I've given him one part of of feature upvote, the dashboard that only a uh, I, I, actual admins and moderators see, and I've asked him to do an audit of that, and he identified some problems, and he's then suggested a um, being more consistent and being more modern and, and uh, has mo- done mock-ups in some tool called Figma, are mm-hmm. you familiar with Figma? Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. what our designer uses too. Yeah. Okay, it must be what designers like to use these days. He introduced yep. it to me. And then uh, now he's just started the process of uh, liaising with our web guy to start turning that into a reality. And I'm actually really excited about it and kind of impatient. And I want to keep asking them both, so show me what you've done now. Show me what you've done now. And I know that's not the right way to manage people. So I'm trying to back off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, five people is is uh, at, at kind of a similar place that we are. Um, h- how do you how do you manage them, especially kind of being part time? I would I would guess that would make it even more difficult because you I, I suppose like have days where they're working with you and days where they're not. What is your general kind of organization and kind of team workflow like? Um, so we use the the typical tools like Slack and, and email and and Jira and GitHub. And we communicate a lot through that. Um, at the moment, everything goes through me, for better or worse. Mm. I'm kind of the um, the hub through which everything goes, and perhaps that's something I need to work on in the year or two ahead. Although maybe not, maybe at this size it's the right way. Who knows? I try to communicate a lot, repeating the same things over and over again, just to make sure that there's a shared mentality of how mm. our product should work and how our approach should be. And that, that actually helps more than I realized. Just keep saying over and over again, keep the product simple, keep the process simple, make it so that the customer doesn't need to think. Mm. And, you know, if I say that once or twice, it doesn't get through. But after I've said it every month for, for a year, people start telling me off when I'm breaking that rule. And then I know it's getting through. Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. I, 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 I really appreciate that last part of when we've done a good job of kind of instilling these things in our team and we break our own rules, they come back and say, you can't, you know, for me, it's you can't interrupt a a dev cycle when you want a thing. Uh (laughs) You can't just tell me to stop (laughs) working on this thing and go over and work on this thing. Uh, Uh Or on the marketing side, you know, you can't just come up with some crazy idea and assume that we can just do it and spend a month working on this thing. So I, I think it's cool. And it's a sign that I think our, our teams have responsibility and ownership over kind of what they're doing, which is, I think, really hard and like the sign of uh, a really mature team. So that's cool. That's cool to hear. Well, yeah, yeah. Just hearing what you said made me think about to what degree you can, I can just trust somebody to do a good job and what degree I need to manage and guide. And I don't think I've quite worked out exactly when to transition from hand-holding to saying, okay, I trust you, go and do your best and just show me the mm. finished product. What mm. about you? you? To what degree do you uh, just get out of the way and let people do their work? Yeah, I think it depends on kind of what area of the business and how much I have done the work ahead of time to be really clear about that. And I think that's where like we all fall down a little bit is if we just fire off a one-liner in Slack to say, you know, go build this thing or can we integrate with Zapier? That is not setting them up for success if we just leave them to be and do it however they want. But if you're, I, I, for me, at least if I'm able to like have a call or put together a notion doc that outlines exactly the kind of marketing thing I want to do or the kind of product I want to build or feature or whatever, that I feel more comfortable with kind of letting somebody be because I mean, history has shown, at least for us that like, if I do that work and I'm really clear, they have a better chance of being successful. And so that that's kind of where I stand on things. And if I had to guess how much of the time that is, these days, maybe it's like 70% of the time. Um, and the rest of the 30% is kind of this iterative process where I, I fire off a one liner in Slack, somebody comes back a day later and says, hey, this is the thing. I say, yep, that's that that is right. 
but this is not. Let's go tweak this one part of things over here. I, I don't know. what What's the percentage for you? Well, that actually aspect there is something I'm struggling with. Actually telling a professional that actually what they did is not the way I want it to be. Mm, and to say yep. that in a way that's respectful and not um, going to discourage them. I don't want to be that boss who just keeps thinking he knows better about everything. And I, yeah, I, I maybe I hear too much the other side and think, well, I'll, I'll just let them do what they want to do because I don't want to tell them. And actually, I think sometimes I do need to be the, the firm hand. So I haven't come to terms with how to do that properly. Yeah. I think the danger there, and and I don't do a great job of this either, but the danger there is if you don't, if you're not clear with people and like really honest, like um, proactively honest, that's not the right word. Like this book, Radical Candor. Have you read this book? No, but that I talks like the about, phrase. Yeah. Yeah. So it talks a lot about this, that like being aggressively open is not the right <laughs> right term, but like radically candor, like being really, really honest and open and objective with people is actually really good for them. Okay. Uh, and really good for their ability to be successful and stuff. And so I, yeah, I don't do a great job of this, but I try very hard um, to to do more of this and be consistent with it. Because I do think that like, if we're as like business owners and leaders, if we're not communicating consistently and really openly with people that, and this, the, this is what I was getting at, it's like it festers over time, right? So you, like if your mm-hmm. developer does things 10% wrong all the time, you're going to think, this guy is a piece of shit. Like he can never mm. build the right stuff. When, if you're honest, it's probably mostly your fault or yeah, my fault. Right, right. Because I did not give the right stuff at the first. And then when they came back with the first version and said, yeah, that, but I want a little more of this or make the button red or whatever. Because they're not bad people, right? Like, <laughs> well, I hope not. And they they care a lot about our, yeah. ours. I mean, I yeah. think care a lot about what we're doing and, and being successful. But it is a super hard, like interpersonal thing to, yeah, give professionals, especially ones that are above where you are in a per- certain discipline, mm-hmm. constructive criticism and feedback about like, hey, yeah, that's just not what I want. That's super hard. Yeah. So I have a specific story to tell about on that theme. Uh, the the web developer and content person I have have worked very closely together for two or three years, first on feature upvote and then starting in April this year on Sabre feedback. And I worked very closely with them in the first year or so, really guiding and being almost difficult. But with Sabre Feedback, they by now knew the way I liked things. Also because of COVID and I was stuck for a few months in Australia in a different time zone, I wasn't able to work with them closely like I would have. So I just basically had to say, say, look, you know how we did feature upvote. I want you to concentrate now on Sabre Feedback, but just SEO. For now, we just need to fix up SEO. I know there's other things you want to do and that need being fixed, but please Mm. just concentrate on SEO. And I kept repeating that, but that was it. Then I just let them go do their thing. And now six months later, I look at the work they achieved and it's pretty much exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can't find that, I think, with a team from day one. It takes a long time to get to where everybody has this common idea of how things should be. And I I'm just ecstatically pleased with how that went. That's cool. Do you think it's mostly that you you did it before and you're trying to just kind of run the same playbook but on a different business the second time? To, to some degree, that is the case, except the playbook's not written. Somehow it was just in the, the, the atmosphere uh, of our team. Mm-hmm. It should be written, mm-hmm. I think. That would be sensible of me. Um, but I'm kind of allergic to writing on processes. It's another thing I'm trying to fix, but... That, I mean, I think that's the next phase, right? Is uh, so we're seven people, we'll be eight next month, and are, that's, are they all full time, Craig? Yeah, seven wow. full time people. Yeah, wow. Um, but that's the next step is to be able to hire somebody and them come in and be productive from day one. Oh, that would be nice. Uh, because I mean, what you're talking about is like onboarding, right? Uh, of your yeah. team took you know a year, and I'm the same way, right? Denise, our our marketing lead for Castos, joined, and we had hour long calls twice a week, just talking about how we do stuff and how I think about marketing and how she thinks about it. I mean, she has a ton of experience that, in a lot of ways, is much more rich than mine. And so, how do we kind of formulate this plan and we pivot and all this kind of stuff? And so now, like, 
we just hired a, a success person. Um, and that, that ramp up time was quicker, but he's still, he's two months in now and still kind of getting his feet wet in certain aspects. So like, yeah, but, but I think if you look at, oh, I don't know, like a, a, a team that's 15 or 20 people, um, you know, like cart, cart hook, maybe, you know, Jordan Gall. I think they can probably hire somebody and that person comes in, has like a mentor, has a bunch of written processes. They know how to get up to speed, a developer or a person in customer service probably gets up to speed in the first month. Um, but that just seems like a mountain. <laughs> like it's, there's a yeah. mountain of organization and documentation and stuff that I, yeah. I'm also allergic to. Yeah. So why did you start your business? Is it because you wanted the right processes or did you start it because you actually enjoyed podcasting? Like, do you have an answer? Do you think about that? Um, so I think the the real reason that Castos exists now is I saw an opportunity, right? So the the story is like uh, this WordPress plugin, seriously simple podcasting that that we own. Um, the person that wrote it originally was going to work for Automatic and wanted to kind of offload this uh, to somebody else. And kind of already being in the podcasting space, actually one of our podcast motor customers came and said, hey, you know, this guy, Hugh Lashbrook, is uh, is selling this plugin. I think this is an interesting space for you guys to get into software if you want to check it out. And so I looked at it and said, wow, this is exactly basically what Blueberry and PowerPress do. But they just don't, you know, seriously, some of podcasting exists, but the hosting arm doesn't. And really in the podcasting space, hosting... At that time, now there's tools like Squadcast that I think are other viable kind of business opportunities. But hosting is the only viable, for me, uh, kind of business model in podcasting. There's just not a lot of different types of businesses. So, um, yeah, just kind of it was an opportunity and made some sense. And, yeah, here we are. I know okay. you, you were much more intentional about, like, kind of lifestyle design and like if I build a business it has to be this like four hour work week potential kind of thing right yeah or well, maybe four hour work day rather than a four hour <laughs> work week <laughs> that's still but, pretty good you know things have changed uh for a couple of reasons one is my daughter being born last year made me think more about what I want to get out of the business but as it keeps growing, especially on feature upvote side of things, I realise that the business has far more potential than I ever imagined when it started. If it keeps growing the way it does, then then it could become quite a uh, serious operation. And, and I'm still in that battle of whether I want to keep my life very relaxed work-wise or whether I want to really do the best I possibly could with it. And I'm I'm still like torn between that. Do you think that it's a, a a one way or the other, like a binary decision? Do you think that you can kind of have a lifestyle business and still get everything, you know, uh, take the business to its maximal opportunity? Do you think those things can exist at the same time? Yeah, they can. Actually, now you ask. I like that. You're just triggered off a third path in my mind. They can. And actually, I, I've discovered that with what I did with Saber Feedback, where I said that I put my web guy and my content person loose on it sometimes I realized I just did nothing to do with that all day and I felt like maybe I'm supposed to be busier running a business why is it that I have still hmm. enough time to go for a bike ride or to take my daughter to the zoo so yeah this this mentality I also have to fight which is just it's okay to not be doing very much and let other people do the work for you yeah 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 I think that you know, we look at at like our mutual friend uh, Carlos from Quaderno. Yeah, I mean they are a hugely successful company. Carlos and I are in a mastermind together, so I have to be careful how much I talk about on the podcast. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's it's pretty like it's in their job descriptions that they work five hours a day, and they are a hundred percent growing. They are very successful. They they could get acquired for you know eight figures, I'm sure. And I think he's just taking this approach that like. I'm going to put five good hours in and then I'm going to stop and it'll be there tomorrow. Right. And I think that's the yeah. thing that for me, like, I don't know, I haven't talked about this much, but like, like we joined tiny seed and I have this attitude that like our business is super important and that we have to have like the pedal to the metal all the time. And I think part of that is my own ego thinking that like I or my business are really important, you know? And maybe maybe they are, and maybe there's really something, and I should 
I do have a lot of respect, but but maybe I also can just say, man, if we just like live a little and, and like have yeah. a little better life work balance, um, the business probably will still do about the same. And I will be more comfortable doing this for 20 years than, right, right. than the other option, which I think is do this really good and go hard for five years and get everything you can out of it. Um, I think like some people we know in, in this world have done that and it takes a toll mentally and physically. And then you still have to go do something afterwards. Anyhow, <laughs> you know, right, like you're, right. you're, you're very few of us are just going to go sit on a beach for the rest of our lives. So I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm getting more days. comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I'm getting more comfortable with saying like, yeah, that middle road of like, we can be a successful, growing, impactful, even high growth business, but I want to work 35 hours a week. Um, yeah. And but though, as a business that should owner, be possible. As a business owner, even if you're not physically working, aren't you always just thinking over things all the mm, time, no matter time. what you're yeah. doing? The inability to switch off is a, a bit of a pain. And I think that's mm. why I could never just like work hard for five years, sell, and then be done. It's like, my, I'd, I'd have this big emptiness of, yeah, of yep. the time. Yep. Yeah. Um, getting back to getting back to kind of living in another place, like talked about work and like owning a business, um, and, and taxes and things like that. Are there other parts of of that, like from a work perspective or not, that that you find challenging or that was surprising that you don't hear other folks talking about? What I found specifically about Spain, this probably doesn't apply to other countries, is that people's mentality is more about enjoying life than about uh, making the most of work. Mm. And that really has been difficult for me, that people think if you are meeting for business at 10 o'clock, it's okay to turn up at quarter past 10. To me, that's completely not okay, and it shows disrespect, but... Not in Spain. This is actually what both sides normally expect. This this has been really tough. That I've come in with one type of mindset. It's very much part of my own country, my own culture. We're, we're the type of place where we just go and do what we have to do, roll up our sleeves, get it done, then leave. Whereas mm. in Spain, it's well. Look, in, in case it sounds like I'm insulting the country, I will say it has one of the highest happiest levels in Europe. It has the longest life expectancy in Europe. They're, they're happy. They're healthy. They have a lot of fun. So I think maybe they're doing it right. And that's 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 something that's very challenging for me, even now after eight years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that a lot of that has rubbed off on me. Uh, and maybe talking about this this kind of balanced attitude I have towards towards work and and like the path that we're on lately is is some of that. Whereas, like, I mean, in the states, there's there's much less. I mean, it's a big place, right? And there's a lot of different people, but there's much less concept of like work life balance and. Yeah, it'll all work itself out and stuff. And I think, yeah, Spain, France, most of kind of Mediterranean Europe is is similar. Do you miss New Zealand? Do you yeah. like I know you went <laughs> back and and like do you do you miss it? Do you sometimes and in some ways, right? Because I think it's not just a yes or no, but like in some ways, do you do you wish you moved back? Not really, but kinda. Uh in the international yearly um, ranks of ease of doing business, New Zealand is either number one or number two year after year. And I look mm. at that and think, here I am in Spain where it's so difficult. And if I went back to my own country, things would be so much easier. I even have talked to a relative of mine who's an accountant about whether it would be easy to move the business there while I stay here. And he said, no. As soon as you do that, you're you know living in one country and running in another. Life is difficult. So business-wise, Yes. Lifestyle wise, no. I, I think my country's really beautiful and I always love visiting it and I'm always happy to leave again. And that's because it's islands in the Pacific, two thousand kilometers from the next closest country. You know, there's yeah. no sense of an international community. There's it's a really literally insular place. So that I don't miss. And there's no chance of me moving there in the in the near future. Mm. Maybe mm, one mm. day, depending on family situations, but was certainly nothing that's on the cards at all. What about yeah. you moving back to the States? Is that something you'd ever do? Uh, if I had to, I would. I, I think probably like you, it's it's. there are many, many, many worse places to move to. You know, I think the U.S. is a big old mess right now, but objectively, like, you know, how much does Donald Trump af- affect my life? 
not not much, right? Like I could go back and live in a little bubble where we have a bunch of friends that think like we do, and I'm sure it would be fine. It would be very sad. But yeah, I mean, I miss I miss very few things on a regular basis. College football just started, and <laughs> being from being from Florida, like that's and living in the southeast most of my life, that's a really fun time. Um, uh huh. It's just really fun, like Saturday college football and tailgating and all this kind of stuff is just a lot of fun, and that just doesn't exist here. But but I mean, it doesn't exist this year really in the states either. Like there's no fans at the game, so. Yeah, I mean, some, some little things like that uh, I miss. I, I think that, that the thing that that really pulls at me sometimes, it, it, and you guys, you can probably relate, is like that depth of connection that I miss with people here or yeah. I'm missing with people here that I undoubtedly would have there. And yeah. I think almost all of it is language. Some of it is cultural. You know, so culture mm-hmm. is not exactly the same thing as language, but it's similar is like really being able to express myself. And so like, I think in a lot of ways, we both probably live, this sounds terrible, like shallow <laughs> lives, <laughs> you know, like in, in person. Oh, the and, yeah. and, and so like how that manifests is that like, you know, my friends in work uh, or my, you know, people I podcast with hear a lot more of my real life than than the people that I see on a, on a daily basis. Now, I think that that's almost everyone in the world right now. Um, yeah. Because even if you're one of these people that still goes into an office, like we have friends that go to Geneva to work, they have to wear a mask all day, every day, from the minute they get out of the car till they leave the parking lot. And there is no water cooler chat. There's no happy hour. There's none of this stuff. So like, I think that's everybody right now. But um yeah, I mean, I think if I'm honest, like on a super long term, like the rest of my life and the rest of my kids' lives basis, that is the biggest thing I think about. It's like, is this the extent that I want to like kind of have connections? Um, yeah. And that I don't have an answer. And maybe, it, it, you know, it gets better every year. My French gets better every year. Your Spanish probably gets better every year. And so I have more deep connections with people. Like we went on vacation with another family last summer for like two weeks and that oh, was really so nice. cool yeah it was that's so really cool nice. and and so maybe that's just kind of getting getting there um but uh but yeah i think that's uh, that's that's if i'm super honest that's like the thing that keeps me up at night a little yeah i understand i really do um but i think you might get to the point where you start romanticizing what it would be like if you were back home yeah uh, and i i've certainly made that mistake i went back to australia for three months a few years ago well more than a few years ago now and uh, back to melbourne where i had spent my 20s and it wasn't what i remembered it being the friends i couldn't wait to spend time with they're now busy with jobs and children and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know their new friends and new interests and uh, other things also they just turns out i've forgotten a lot of the bad things and just remembered the good things that possibly weren't there anymore yeah and it actually helped me get that out of that mentality a lot. And I came back to Spain more appreciative of life here. Mm, mm. Do you, uh, are your parents still alive in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, they're in New Zealand, which is why we go there. But the idea is every year to take my, my daughter, but COVID's put pay to that, so we're not going this year. Uh, but it's, it's, while my parents are around, that's what we'll do. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's for us, that's, that's one of the kind of biggest external draws is, you know, yeah, our family is all in the States. Um, and we try to, yeah, we haven't been back, uh, last Christmas we saw them. So yeah, it'll be, I don't know, another year before we can see them now, I think, um, which is really weird and sad, but yeah, I think that's something talking about. When you're young and single, maybe doing a digital nomad thing, perhaps you can cope with the fact that you won't see your family, standard family or your parents for a while. But when you've got young children, and you're more settled, that's actually something, right? To miss out on mm. your children, miss out on that chance on regularly spending time with grandparents or the uncles and aunties or so on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, I think, you know, the upside, we haven't talked much about upside is like our kids <laughs> are growing up in a really great place. Like the, the yeah. place we live is really great, super safe, really vibrant and international, like the scenery, and the nature here and the the health and mindset of the people is really great. 
I'm sure this exists other places, but but I it's not like anywhere I've lived and we've lived at I've lived in eight different places in the US and the place it's most similar to is San Diego, but without all the like kind of California posers, you know. <laughs> Sorry for all the California people out there. But is, does it have the concept of suburbs like you have in San Diego or in America, or is it more that everybody lives in smaller places in the, in the core of the, yeah, of the town? Yeah, like uh, it's more it's more that like there are cities and there are villages on the out you know outside of those cities. Yeah. Um. So yeah, c- c- it's kind of the same thing, I think. When I take my daughter out for a, a walk, which I try to do most days, like. We, we see so many people in the neighborhood who know us and know her by name and interact with her. And this is a real positive thing about a child growing up here. Sure, we're a long way from the grandparents, but it's a really fun environment to be growing up in. And for her, mm-hmm. this is normal. She knows nothing else. Yeah. 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 I mean, our kids, my daughter was five and my son was three when we moved. And so he said the other day, he's like, I don't remember you know, the house we lived in in the U.S. before we moved here. I was like, yeah, I don't expect you would. Like, it's it's all they've ever known. Yeah, and I think, I mean, living a long way from the grandparents is a bummer. If we didn't have this great kind of community feel that sounds like you have as well, we we wouldn't have stayed. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely, it definitely is a, a two-sided coin. I think overall, we definitely are happy to be living here. It, it's not for the faint of heart, though, is, is I think the thing we're saying is like you, you definitely should go in eyes open and say like there are a lot of things that are really hard there. It creates this stress that, you know, folks living in their own home country don't have. Um, but I think the upside is definitely there, too. Yeah, I completely agree. Oh, we've yeah. made some great friends, mostly as part of our expat bubble, but mm, whatever yeah. the friends we've learned to sort out the ones who are coming here for six months from the ones who are coming here indefinitely. Because right. it just gets too hard to keep making friends and then they move away. We make friends, they move away. So now we, we just filter out the ones who are not intending to stay long term. Mm, mm, yep, yep. And that's, that's good. made a big difference. So it's all about the people around you. Like, sure. Like it's, that mindset. it's like the people you work with too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Cool, Steve. This is really fun to catch up and, and really dive into this. I don't think I've ever talked this long or in-depth about this. So it's cool to be able to talk to somebody who can relate to to a lot of these things. Uh, and I think it's 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 important for folks to hear uh, if they're thinking about it. For folks who want to kind of catch up with you and learn more about kind of what you're up to, where's where's the best place to go? Okay, so on Twitter, I tend to be active these days, uh, at Steve Off McLeod. Um, probably have to spell that in the show notes. Um, Saber Feedback, the product I acquired is saberfeedback.com. And then featureupvote.com is the feature request tracking site. You can also find me at bootstrapped.fm, which is the podcast I run and it published episodes weekly. Awesome. Steve, this is a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thank you, Craig. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Rogue Startups. If you haven't already, head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show. For show notes from each episode and a few extra resources to help you along your journey, head over to roguestartups.com to learn more.